Uh, we'll start. Welcome to Advancing Ayurveda Through Ethnobotany Drug Development Symposium. We're looking forward to hearing from experts in the fields of Ayurvedic medicine and pharmaceutical science. Please be aware that the symposium is being recorded. You may text, the guests may text questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, and the questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. I now have the privilege to introduce Dr. Suhas Shirsagar. Dr. Suhas is a classically trained Ayurvedic physician with over 30 years of clinical experience. He's a best-selling author, motivational speaker, and an acclaimed educator in the field of Ayurveda and integrative medicine. He has traveled around the globe popularizing Ayurveda, yoga meditation, and natural medicine. Dr. Suhas has formulated some very successful herbal products, generating multi-million dollars in revenues. He was featured in many popular podcasts, radio, and television shows. He is an advisor to the Chopra Center and is the director of Ayurvedic Healing Incorporated. Welcome, Dr. Suhas. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And once again, it's my great joy and honor to be a part of this August assembly, I would say. We are bridging brilliant minds from the East and the West and discussing something which is very close to our heart, which is bringing Ayurveda to the world stage and understanding the potential in Ayurvedic herbs and how we can take it to the next level to really understand and bring this gift that is around for a very, very long time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share my screen and open my presentation and it'll probably give us a little quick rundown of some of the topics that I want to share. Uh, it won't be very long. So we are talking about advancing Ayurveda with ethnobiology and drug discovery. So one of the things that I really want to bring it to everybody's notice is that this herb that we are discussing here today has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And the concept that we are doing is almost like the concept of reverse pharmacology, where we are talking about something which is around for thousands of years, which is tested on human beings for a long time. So we are going from man or human being to maybe mice to the labs and bringing it back again to people. So this concept of reverse pharmacology is bringing back the strength of Ayurveda, which is science of life. And especially where we are talking about not only the epigenome and the internal state, how the body functions in the physiology without diluting the strength of Ayurveda, which is of course lifestyle and personalized medicine. There's an age old saying in Ayurveda that treat a patient as a whole and use the herb as a whole. We have always talked about restoring that potential of within the herb where it kind of carries out all the different elements without dil diluting, creating any side effect as such. But this is the time to really understand, dissect and look closely that what is in there that really works and understanding the pathways how these unique phytonutrients are going in the system and are doing what they're supposed to do. It has been a long <clears> time <throat> that we have seen. There are currently about more than 130, 40 real drugs that are available, which come originally from herbs itself. We're talking about so many things that have led to this kind of a discovery from turmeric to curcumin, from amalaki to amblycanin A, and B, Sarpaganda to Reserpine, Windcristin, Windblastin, um, the whole opium uh, uh, genre is, is that we are all familiar with. Ayurvedic Pharmacopoeia is about over 100,000 herbs. And it's about time that we talk about their medicinal properties and understand the pathways. The herb that we are talking about today, and I would allow Dr. Shastri to speak more about it because he's an expert, but Artemisia absinthium, which is Damnaka, which is from the family uh, of um, Astracy. And, uh, and what we're talking about here, that this herb that Ayurveda is aware of its Jvaragna and the Krumigna qualities, where it reduces fever, it is anti-inflammatory, it is vermicidal, and the Katu Katu Ushna properties. It is bitter in taste, it is also astringent in taste, it is light, dry, pungent heating. And that's those are the properties that we are looking when we are seeing the herb to be used in human trials itself. In fact, in spite of all these properties, it balances all the three doshas itself. 
and its property to reduce fever, to reduce mucus, to reduce cough and reduce respiratory distress <clears throat> is exactly what is being studied under the microscope and with the human trials itself. And these are some classical uh, references that we have seen that Damanastu Varastikto Rudyo Vrishat. Rudyo is an interesting term because whenever we see uh, a, a potent extract of artemisin used in, in along with piperin or something that we see some cardiotoxic properties. But here it is actually cardiotonic. It is a cardiotonic which it protects the heart itself and doesn't create any imbalances with what we see with the ST interval itself. And more importantly, it is Tridosh Shamana. It is coming from Bhav Prakash. It is coming from Dhanvantari Nighantu itself. And these are poetic Sanskrit names that they have used. Every time we see an herb with fabulous properties, they have given some very poetic names to it. Gandhot Kata, Brahma Jato, Vinitaha, Muniputra, Tapasvi. So these are all excellent nerves which are, which are poetic, but it also kind of suggests the properties that it will have in the system itself. So what we are doing here is we are looking at this Ayurvedic herb of Damanaka, Dvipantara Damanaka, and more importantly, we are using uh, a potent extract of this in a, in a powder form, about 500 milligram capsule, to be given to people who are tested COVID positive, <laughs> and it's just one capsule given once a day for five days together. And it actually follows not only the Ayurvedic protocol, but even how this drug is, is working for fever, inflammation, for respiratory imbalances, and more importantly, inhibiting the, the TGF beta storm that is unleashed by the viral toxicity itself. And many of the allied symptoms, fever, headache, inflammation, all of those things are diminished significantly. And we'll be talking a little bit more about how it works and what it does. So it doesn't create any respiratory distress. It actually prevents pulmonary fibrosis because if the lung damage is happening, then uh, you don't have COVID, but you are, you are dealing with this for the rest of your life. So this is in time that we are using a very potent herb, which not only relieves the symptoms, but protect your vital vital organ like lung itself. So I think this is this is something that is being tested compared to the existing therapies of remdesivir, chloroquine, even the combination of various herbs. And I think we are more and more confident as we see the human trials that this is something which is going to be a very effective way to address this pandemic that we are all facing. Thank you, so, Dr. Suhas. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Sorry, you. yeah, your time is up. That was a wonderful introduction to artemisinin. And we are now um, welcoming Dr. Chandra Kant Katiar, is the Chief Executive Officer, Technical Amami Limited, Kolkata, India, responsible for research and development and quality control of Ayurvedic herbal drugs. Head of Research and Development at Debor India Limited, Delhi and Director of Herbal Drug Research at Ranboxy Research Lab in CR Delhi. He is a Head of Medical Affairs and Clinical Research at Dabur India Limited, and he is currently Vice Chairman of National Pharmas Phytopharmaceutical Mission of Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India. He has many years of experience in clinical trials on Ayurvedic drugs, as well as synthetic molecules, expertise in pharmacological studies and talk Exological evaluation of herbal drugs. Welcome, Dr. Katir. Thank you, Jennifer and uh, Dr. Shekhar and Dr. Suhas. Let me just uh, share uh, my screen. So uh, I'll be talking uh, about the Ayurvedic drug development in a scientific manner. And uh, uh, so you see, uh, thousands of years ago, one physician was preparing the drug himself for his patient. It was the trust of the patient and trust of the physician also. Both were working for each other. After that, when commercialization started, then uh, physicians in India also, very few physicians are now preparing medicines. Most of this job has gone to the 
industry. So now commercialization has led to the regulatory controls, which are looking at basically three parameters, which are quality, safety, efficacy. And WHO has added one more attribute of affordability. So what is the process? How do we develop a drug in the industry is, first of all, we receive a concept and then we develop certain, we identify optimal herbs going uh, after doing thorough biologic literature research, uh, like what uh, Dr. Swad just shared about Artemisia, uh, about Damanak. So like that, thorough research is done and then we have few prototypes and also side by side, phytochemistry is done and then most efficient, we are, we are uh, applying some bioassays to see which one is the potent attribute. And then we move forward, develop analytical test uh, methods for quality testing. And then stability is done for all the products. Then toxicity is done for the product. And then either human clinical trial or observational studies. And that's how this project, uh, this uh, product gets through. These are the 13 steps involved uh, in the drug development in any typical Ayurveda industry, which, are, uh, uh, which, which if you see on the left side, we are giving what are the steps involved. On the right side, we are giving what are the expertise required. And that, that, that varies from taxonomy to microbiology to pharmaceutics to analytical chemistry to pharmacology. And beyond all that, Rashastra and Dravigun from Ayurveda itself. So it's a, it's a um, it, it's a confluence of the expertise required in development of the product in today's context. What are the human resources requirement? Ayurveda expert, herbal pharmaceutical technology expert, bioresources, taxonomy, phytochemistry, and these are the modern pharmacology, foundation experts, regulatory uh, experts, toxicologists, and clinical pharmacologists. All these are the uh, human resources required. If you ask me what is a typical R&D structure in Ayurvedic industry today, they are having these minimum nine or 10 different departments, which is having one Ayurveda department, we have an expert will be there, then quality assurance, then analytical, then pharmacognosy, formulation, macrobiology, bioassay, medical research, and bioresources for cultivation and uh, uh, supply of the uh, medicines. All of them have uh, to play their role. If you look at the formulation development, we uh, right, right, right now all the industries have become, uh, uh, are using modern technology uh, in uh, hybrid drug development. So spray drying after extraction, tablet coating, machine is being used. These are the lab scale uh, system. For Asavarista also, which is unique contribution of hybrid, we are now using fermenters. For the pharmacology department, is, uh, work starts from taxonomy on the authentication of the right uh, plant material. Because if the right plant material authenticity is not there, the product is not going to be right, not going to be effective. Phytochemistry job is isolate compounds from this for standardizing the product. <clears throat> so what we look in the product? Quality, safety, efficacy. In quality, we look for the best bed consistency for this chromatography is being used, safety, normally the, all the most of the products are uh, going through the toxicity studies besides contaminant uh, testing like heavy metals. And uh, in efficacy, besides clinical trial, now there are faster methods are available with Dr. Swad referred to as reverse pharmacology like the bioassays. Now, what is the concern of safety in 2004? One paper from JAMA uh, by SAPER it should, it, it, it created a flutter in the circles of the government in India. And uh, what happened was, after that, uh, some stakeholder replied that, no, no, uh, the method was wrong. No, no, the product uh, methodology of manufacturing might be uh, wrong. Uh, and it made government went into the knee-jerk reaction. And after that, what happened was, government came out with the mandatory heavy metal testing report. But it is not only heavy metal factor is responsible for safety concern are too many. Use of toxic substances, improper manufacturing process, contaminants including heavy metals, adulteration, improper use, all, all that can be lead to it. Now, uh, when it comes to heavy metal testing, uh, the government, uh, now there are, uh, these are the SPSC limits for India, lead 10 ppm, arsenic 3 ppm, 
cadmium 0.3 ppm and mercury 1 ppm it is mandatory now L look at the this one typical uh, case study of the toxicity toxicity studies how we are doing it following oecd guidelines and there are the some of the mercurial preparations by the way and all of them are found to be safe they are conducted for 28 or 90 day tox studies and uh, but when we come to the improper manufacturing process look at the bottom one kb3 look at the top one kbo so this is the sang bhasmar kapardika bhasam the quality should say that if you keep in the water for 75 minutes the ph should not change if you look at the top one ph is changing from 7 to 10 if the bottom one ph is ranging from 7 to 7.3 to therefore the quality of the water bottom one is right the quality of the upper one is not right therefore if we if you play with the you don't follow the proper procedures of manufacturing it may lead to toxic effect they very simple methods and addition in addition to that now how drug interaction is and uh, another additional aspect now we we in india we at our company at least we have started these sip uh, assays uh, on every new product for we are developing for interactions and uh, the, we we are we are following some uh, these sip a2 sip uh, 2c9 sip c19 sip 3a4 sip 3a4 the most commonly used and uh, Uh, some some example i'll give of the celestia extract we 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 use the celestia extract with the uh, anti hypertensive drugs anti cholesterol drugs anti diabetic drugs did not see any interaction so there are now we are doing mandatorily in our company when it comes to quality it's a regulatory requirement ayurvedic pharmacopeia of india has given lot of parameters for raw material and the finished product quality parameters they are mandatory in process quality checks are also used but in addition to that four contaminants if you look heavy metal testing pesticide residue aflatoxin and microbial load they are now mandatory and most of the good companies are following that not only in finished product also in the raw material if it does not involve the metallic ingredients some of the some of the equipment what we use for standardization for quality uh, are are here This is the pancharista is a asavarista what we have, right? This is the classical formulation too. Jandu drakcharis, Jandu aipatikka chon. This is how we are uh, standardizing the product. This is the one under product we are using batch to batch for to infuse batch to batch. For efficacy, multiple methods are there, but now we are going for basically cell line studies, which uh, we have a bioassay lab, and in India, a lot of companies are now going for. bioassay bioassay studies where we can test uh, enzymatic methods like uh, you see tyrosine inhibition acetyl choline steroid inhibition all those at, at, and there within 2 to 3 days time we can get the efficacy data so uh, so those kind of studies are now becoming very very common and i think this is the last slide so for any ios industry we need so many expertise area we need taxonomy phytochemistry analytical chemistry formulation development pharmacology in uh, pharmacology including molecular pharmacology drug safety biotechnology pk also right now there is one class of drug added in the pharmaco uh, phytopharmaceutical they are they, they are uh, pharmaco kinetics have been made compulsory at least of one compound we are working for two phytopharmaceutical products right now besides that clinical research regulatory affairs and cqv and manufacturing these are any typical ibc air industry in india need these kind of departments as on today so from one physician one drug for one patient we have moved so much uh, in the journey in science and and all these science and technology has played a uh, major role so with this thank you very much uh, any questions we would welcome we would uh, i think on thread the end of the session if the time permits thank you very much jennifer and uh, dr suhas and dr shekhar and uh, all the dignitaries any question most welcome thank, thank you. you very much dr katiar we'll take questions at the end of all the presentations sure so we'll we'll come back to you about that um yes thank you for that information on ayurvedic drug development we'll now hear from dr 
Balram Singh, who will be speaking about Ayurvedic herbal research. He has been a professor since 1990 and Henry Dreyfus teacher scholar since 1997 at University of Massachusetts Dartmouth until 2014 and at the Institute of Advanced Sciences, INADS, Dartmouth, Massachusetts. He is also an adjunct professor at the School of Sanskrit and Indic Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. He is currently the president of the Institute of Advanced Sciences and also the founder of Prime Bio Incorporated, a biotechnology based company. Dr. Singh is the founding director of the Botulinum Research Center located at INADS and the founding director of the Center for Indic Studies at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Welcome, Dr. Balram Singh. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Can I get to share my slides, please? Oh, sure. I will just stop. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to, to see this conference, and I want to thank you and uh, to Matian um, Therapeutics to bring this uh, seemingly different systems of medicine, but both connected to the to the health of the public health. And uh, and I see that you know the Matian Matian being. Um, a company that has a history of generating uh, uh, therapeutics based on modern science. But getting into this, I think this is a very uh, good thing to happen. And uh, in somebody who is, is in, on, on both world and, and is willing to communicate with each other. I do work with botulinum toxin, uh, listening to um, Dr. Tatiar's talk about you know metals and other things. I work with botulinum toxin, which is about 100 billion times more toxic than cyanide. Uh, forget about the metals. And, and it is a medicine. It's a natural product and the medicine. So I think one has to understand the system uh, and appropriate use of it. You have to have the guidance of Vedyas who are more than just a doctor. And I think the process is more than just the science that we know today. That doesn't mean that science cannot catch up with it. But I think we need to have that realization. So with those initial remarks, and I also, I think artemisinin is a, as we will hear more about it, it's just not just a compound. I think it comes from a system. So that will be another very important thing for us to watch. But I wanted to, um, to just talk in general about Ayurveda and how I think it works and some of my own work uh, that I have some experience with. One of them is, is Ayurveda is a very complex system, uh, even though, Dr. Katyari is saying that maybe they're moving away from individuals, but it's so important to continue to have that, uh, that knowledge or that understanding or that sense that we're still treating individuals. It didn't just, I mean, we have to meet the requirements of today's uh, regulatory issues. I think that's okay. But I think we should understand this is a very complex system that has been put into an individual's body. So many things are affecting and we need to understand that always individualized um, efforts are important. In this, I, I just, I mean, I do not have time to talk about every details about the seasonal change, dietary uh, situation and behavioral situation. Those are very important. The rest of it is uh, related to the individual, but the seasonal and dietary and behavioral, so behavioral individual, uh, but related to the society as well and seasonal and dietary related to herbs. A lot of things change around us uh, in, the, in the environment. So that, that prakriti is important, not only prakriti of the individual, but also the prakriti of the, the, the whole system. And, and so in that context, uh, we should look at these, these, uh, these things. And what I think uh, is very telling is that uh, the many of the drugs that we have today in so-called uh, modern science-based drugs, majority, large majority, two thirds of them are related to natural products. They are uh, coming from either inspired by natural products or directly from natural products. Only about 40% uh, of them are, uh, are synthetic. 
And that, you know, the, we have to remember all the way the drugs really started with natural products. Uh, we, the history of drugs really is natural products. So we have to always remember that where this is coming from and what we can learn and what we continue to learn. And as science catches up, then we will see that these things will become more obvious. And I think that's one of the area that we should, we should think about. The natural products based drugs are being approved every year. I mean, this is just a, okay, taken from a publication in 2011 right, that you can see it all the time. So I think artemisinin has a good uh, future. Uh, based on this, it's, it's not something that completely new and nobody understands that, although I think we need to find a way to explain in the language that modern science and modern medicine people understand this. And I think it should be uh, possible to do. I just wanted to compare this, uh, the two systems of um, uh, medicine. Uh, fortunately, we end up doing both of these in our lab. So we have a little bit of firsthand uh, knowledge. The first one I consider as a structural chemistry. Everything is based on the structure, this enzyme, that molecule, that physiology, how it fits in there, and how we do the um, modeling and, and whatever. And then eventually uh, select some, some uh, lead compounds and eventually take them to either test tube model or cell model, like, like Dr. Katyar is saying, or animal model. And then finally, if everything is okay, then we take it to uh, formulation of drugs and study the stability and, and other things, uh, quality control, and then eventually do the, uh, hopefully uh, get through the uh, clinical <laughs> trials. Most of the drugs don't <laughs> succeed in this process. So there is a high rate of failure. And uh, that's part of the reason why drugs are very expensive. On the other hand, the, the, the Ayurveda system is very different. Uh, it, it has people who have a sense you know, they don't have necessarily structures in their head. They have sense like Dr. Um, Chir Sagar was mentioning about, you know, the taste and, you know, how it looks and things like that, which is so obvious, you know, almost anybody can do. And if you do enough uh, practice of this, you should be able to get a good training to do that. And then they use, these Vedya uses a sense to examine herbs. Um, and then they come up with the product, many times a product only for that individual. And, and so I, that's basically functional chemistry, not, it's not a structural chemistry. And uh, later on, I, I revised this and it started calling a sensory chemistry uh, because really the senses are so much involved, both the patients and the Vedya. And now I think, although I don't understand the Tanmatra that much, but I'm trying to figure out uh, how to call it Tanmatra chemistry because that's really what it is because there is a sense behind, there is a power behind the senses and that is very important to develop. So when we are able to do this uh, things, let's say, I mean, many times people ask me, why don't we just use the, like Dr. Katyar is saying and doing, uh, why don't we just develop, or, or uh, Matian is trying to do, develop drug and go through the whole process. Well, it takes long time and it costs a lot of money and then defeats the purpose. So it, I think this is very important to, to keep in mind and I'm happy that Matian is, is very much committed uh, to low cost and be able to provide it to the to the people. And I think that kind of industry needs to be uh, more promoted and, and encouraged. So I want to now give an uh, example of um, uh, uh, just a, a brief example of uh, one uh, thing that we have Tulsi plant as uh, Asimum sanctorum. sanctum. Um, and uh, what we have done is that we have isolated some fractions. And what we found that there are several um, genes which normally promote uh, uh, carcinogenesis are downregulated in only in the carcinogenic cells, not in the normal cells. So that's just the Tulsi thing. And what it also does, it has this, this fraction also increases this NCAM, which is a, a, a protein that in, it starts re-differentiation. I mean, the cancer cells can come back, not only prevents cancer, but also can uh, get them back. And, and so finally we are analyzing, and I obviously don't have time to talk about all this detail, but we have analyzing this from HPLC and we have now identified actually compounds and I can only make the statement that we have uh, the compounds which seems to be working like almost like a, a team. You know, there is a one group of compounds out of Tulsi which works on redifferentiation, and it is another group of compound which works on the dedifferentiation. So the the point is that it it kind of 
fixes their cancer cells into normal cells and the normal cells retain them into, into the normal cells. I think that is almost like an intelligent uh, 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 system or in intelligent uh, person, which is really just a plant. Uh, Dr. Katiar already introduced, so I'm not going to talk about this, the problem that has been created, especially in the United States about the mercury and particularly with Dr. Saper's group whom I met and I think we have better understanding about these things. Uh, but we did some, this, this basma is not just metal, even though you can find the metal content to be almost 100% or 80%, not, we're not talking about PPM here, we're talking about a lot of it. But basma is not the, just metal. Um, you know, those of you who do not read Hindi of, or Sanskrit, I'm sorry about it, but the basma is really written like this, which literally means nistage or means removing the toxicity. Basma really means removing the toxicity. And uh, what we have done is in the cellular model, we have shown that, you know, when we use the same nanoparticle from silver uh, made from modern uh, science versus the basma, basma is not toxic at all, whereas the silver nanoparticles made modern science could be very, very toxic. So I think there is a process that one has to know. Not only they're not very toxic, that actually they are very good for, for the system and they act as bioenhancers and they can be, you know, maybe the Ayurvedic doctors know more. I don't know that much about that, but they definitely uh, can be used uh, for, for a good purpose. So understanding this basic science behind the whole thing is very helpful and have to remain, remember the tradition. We as a scientist, modern scientists, do not have to impose our way we need to use our tools, that's no, no problem, but we need to understand the, the ways that had this science has developed, the Ayurvedic science has developed over thousands of years. I just want to finish with last two slides to think that we think that herbs are, uh, are just like herbs, but actually they have sense, like I told earlier, they do have sense. I did experiment, actually this was experiment done by my, uh, my uh, daughter and son, and they, they tried to show that, you know, if you put a, 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 red, a red tomato in the middle surrounded by the green tomato, then you find that after uh, three days, they all start changing their color. Same thing about the, the chili. Uh, so they have a sense, just like we, we see other people and we start behaving differently. They also do behave like that. And this will be considered an intelligence if we really didn't know uh, the science about it. There is, a, there is real chemistry behind it, but nevertheless, just the look of it is like very sensible. And the reason they are very sensible is that they have been there for a very long time, much longer than we have. You said one minute, uh, Jennifer, did you say one minute? Uh, yes, actually time is up right now. Okay, so, so did you give me one minute? Finish up. Uh, one minute you finish. alert or no? Did you give me one minute alert or not yet? Uh, we can consider that the one minute alert. All right. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm a good negotiator about time. So, uh, so this, this is, this is my last slide anyway. So what I'm trying to say is that human being and this, my lab is working on the molecular dynamics of evolution. And so we are very, very fascinated with this Ayurveda idea that, you know, we have come across all this and the, the, so that the plants are really part of our evolution. They, be, they are in us and that's why we respond to them. And it's very important that we continue to understand the interaction, the complex interaction between human physiology and our environment. And plants are a very good example of, because they have products that we use, we live and we survive on it. And I think that understanding for medicine uh, like uh, RT medicine, and I think will be a fantastic idea. And I hope that we will uh, continue to collaborate on some of these very practical things and find better science for other people to understand as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. That was wonderful. Uh, we will now be hearing from we will now be healing, hearing from Dr. Shekhar. Uh, Professor Shekhar has an MD in Ayurveda and since 2002 has been the founding director of OJAS LLC Ayurveda Wellness Center in Pennsylvania, USA. He is a founder, president, and chairman of the Board of Association of Ayurvedic Professionals of North America. He is director of global Ayurveda conferences, offering various international and national conferences around the globe and established global Ayurveda Academy. Welcome, Dr. Shekhar. Can you share my slides, please? Oh, sure. 
welcome you all thank you very much for giving a great opportunity with this matian and uh, dr suhas and jennifer and uh, dr katia dr shastri and shastra and dr um, balram singh ji and uh, saran ji and everybody and uh, so that's a very good platform this is the thing exactly i am doing what i am doing this lectures almost uh, 10 lectures i have given in indian community also advancing of ayurveda through ethnobiology biology and uh, how ayurvedic drug development this is the various universities also university of pennsylvania nursing school jefferson medical colleges and everything i am teaching these classes so next so how can i change okay herbal drug <clears throat> so this is the problem biggest problem is for us drug development is happening enormously within 200 years they reached the highest peak level of the drug development pharma industry has developed our industry ayurveda industry has still holding that ancient traditional way of manufacturing and putting these things we need to have revolutionary steps we have to do it that's exactly what i am thinking about that next please so now look into that so 2019 1805 the pharmacist german pharmacist from the opium plant he developed the morphine within 215 years they are able to do brain surgeries cardiac surgeries every surgical procedures with the anesthesia they are able to do it still our ayurvedic doctors in md ayurveda ms ayurveda people they are not able to diabetes uh, diagnose or bring one ayurvedic drug which can be very effective localized anesthesia can be done very simple anesthesia can be done and not to depend upon a modern anesthesia and what they are doing we are doing shara sutra surgical procedures and hemorrhoidectomies and everything we are doing and uh, whereas we are using the modern technology modern anesthesia we need to develop our own drug development and this is the thing this is the very good metian can bring this wonderful knowledge for us next so first of all we need to look into that huh? we don't know if we give the medication for the people like that we don't know the pharmacological action how the root of the medication we have so many ways to do give kashayams asavas aristas basmas thailams everything is there how much oil we are applying on the massage therapy how much oil is absorbed in the system we can't answer we can tell that stories about that vata pitta kapha they reduce the doshas and everything we can talk about that udvartanam kapharam medasah pravilapanam tirikana manganam tok prasada karam param shlokas we can do it but the scientific validation how we can bring it this is the thing is important and blood brain barrier herbal vaccines why can't we create our own vaccines and herbal vaccinations like that injectables where we are lacking of these things intramuscular intravenous intrathecal there are so many ways we can do this modern technology we can use it and use this technology and how these medicines are absorbed through the skin and sublingual medications if for example a person is suffering yesterday one one of my patient died with heart attack if we are able to come up with arjuna our pushkar mula and sublingual medication at least we can put it that at least we can transfer that patient to the hospital at least these tablets are available safer medications are there sublingual it is available like that then we can save the people aerosol sprays and nebulizers which is exactly 1990s when i was doing md in bronchial asthma patients so this is exactly what i was looking for the nebulizers simple nebulizers can be created miristica nagi cutfall and ginger cardamom so many volatile drugs are there ayurvedic drugs are there with this we can create a nebulizer immediately 10 within 10 minutes we can show the episode of the bronchial asthma patient can be relieved that's better next slide please transdermal intrathecal subcutaneous rectal vaginal ocular arctic various levels we can do this lot of work next modern scientific research on the herbs there are plenty of books are available plenty of research has done dr katia dr shastri so many pharmacologists dr Sh uh, singh and there are scientists who have done a lot of studies Let, let's go back to uh, next slide please next slide respiratory system think about this is the thing exactly damanaka damanaka we are talking dama means in in gujarati asthma means in respiratory disorders all respiratory disorders this will be a boon for us that means all this uh, corona virus which is creating attacking on the and the patients with this things problem with their respiratory problems this is a wonderful way damanaka is a very good removing this things what i recommend from you all of you that uh, why can't we take damanaka added with uh, zinc 
and vitamin C, it potentiate the effect of the medicine to go into the fast acting and go into the deeper tissues and having a faster development and faster improvement in these things. There are so many studies are done on anti-asthmatic bronchodilatic, bronchiolitics and antitussives. Next slide, please. Anti-diabetic medications, there's plenty of studies are done. Next slide, please. Malignant diseases, anti-cancer, cytotoxic, supportive medicines like the Shatavari, Sharlaki. Next slide, please. Chemo prevention purpose, immunomodulators. The plenty of immunomodulators are developed in Ayurveda. Next slide, please. Antioxidants. Next. Anti-mutagenics. Next. Infectious diseases, like antibacterial. Sir. We do not have any antibacterial medications. Let us look into these things, sir. Vacha, Asaka, Rasona, Shatavari, Musta, Cyprus, these are the wonderful medications are there. Why can't we make extract of these things? At least we can show these things. This is the Ayurveda medicine. It becomes subcontinent to the only one, one location in India and uh, in the Asian countries. We need to bring the globalization of Ayurveda. Globalization of Ayurveda, on the global language we need to talk. That means uh, we have to talk the global language, then only Ayurveda can grow into further. Next slide, please. And your time is winding yes. up. Thank you. Next slide. Anti caries, next. Anti fungal, next. Anti tubercular, there's the tubercular medications are there. Next slide, please. Antivirals. This is exactly what we are needed to look into the Damanaka along with that. How potentiate the medication for faster action and very effective way in clinical studies and uh, animal studies and every level we have to work on that. Next level. Antiprotozoals. Next slide, please. Insecticides. That sense. Thank you very much for this great opportunity for me to speak and within a short period of time. That's exactly what we are looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shekhar. That was wonderful. Uh, we'll next be hearing from Dr. Sastri. He is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Medicinal Plants Board, Ministry of Ayush and the Government of India. Dr. Sastri belongs to a traditional Ayurveda family from <laughs> Kakinada in Andhra Pradesh. He is currently head of healthcare research for Dabur Research and Development Center. He is a member of Ayurvedic Pharmacopoeia Committee, Government of India, and member of U.S. Pharmacopoeia Committee for Herbal Medicines. He is joint secretary of Association for Manufacturers of Ayurvedic Medicines and executive member of Ayurvedic Drug Manufacturers Association. Welcome, Dr. Sastri. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, 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 that was the previous uh, CV which was uh, given to somebody. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, for the introduction. Uh, without wasting much time, uh, I first of all uh, thank uh, Shekhar and Nikshit Sagar for introducing me to this wonderful uh, team and audience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just uh, let me take you through the next 15 minutes because I've taken one minute right now. Uh, I'm asked to just speak about uh, the anti inflammatory properties of uh, Artemisia absentium. Okay, well, but uh, that, that can be discussed because everybody is familiar. But when I have seen uh, uh, the term Dvipanta uh, Damanaka, it uh, rather uh, pinched me. Therefore, uh, I just diverged myself from the topic proper, though I cover it because uh, I want to enlighten. Uh, now I'm uh, looking into the medicine plants and responsible for guiding people in the right direction. Therefore, uh, I give more emphasis on uh, how to identify this uh, as an uh, Indian plant, and then uh, we get into it. Okay, before that, let's now uh, look at uh, the history. In 2015, Artemisia has given uh, the traditional medicine, the first novel, followed by 2018, another uh, on the circadian rhythm. So people started looking beyond the modern medical science. That's something we should look at. And uh, Artemisia led us to this. And just remember, we are all uh, speaking high about modern methodologies, uh, and our friends, they all have limitations. Uh, the Malaria Research Institute in US, the last 45 years, could not come out with any molecule. The National Institute of Malaria Research at Delhi, 
they could not uh, come out with uh, any any kind of uh, chemical moiety or compound or uh, molecule in the last uh, 40 years plus. Do you know what's the reason? They depend upon uh, plasmodium brevi uh, as uh, the, the uh, model used in rats. And we don't know whether the drug works or uh, the animal dies first. People who have worked on this model can appreciate. And after working on this, uh, uh, for a while, uh, I decided this is not the suitable model. It may be a big statement, but it's a fact. That's why we are not successful in malaria research. Let us realize the truth. But whereas Artemis Nin, which did not work on the plasmodium brevi, has become an add-on therapy and is successful. Let us know the limitations. Science is not uh, uh, foolproof in each and everything. And especially for traditional medicine, the routine models and the uh, chemical, uh, analytical chemistry doesn't work for us. So this is one of the, uh, the major uh, statements I want to make before I enter into the uh, subject proper. Uh, there's a lot of synonyms are there which will confuse you. Artemisia is probably one of the largest uh, genus in uh, Astrace, which has more than 200 species. And again, a lot of varieties, remember this. So people, people who have confusion on Artemisia absentium is an exotic plant to India, please forget about it. This is the official website of uh, Biodiversity India and their portal, yes, you find uh, the geographical locations uh, uh, right now uh, here in uh, Jammu Kashmir and Himachal Pradesh, these species are available. So <laughs> my dear friends, uh, uh, but, the, but the question is whether this, this is a species which we are uh, uh, having uh, in, in our uh, research is uh, something which we need to. These are very close species, just I'll take you through. Artemisia absinthum, Artemisia vulgaris, Artemisia martima and Artemisia anua. Apart from the, these things, we have a species called uh, Artemisia uh, princeps. Those who uh, uh, actually know Indian traditions like Kshir Sagar, uh, Dr. Kshir Sagar was having a idol of Lord Ganesha with garland behind him when I was looking at it. In this puja and every uh, 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 monsoon, uh, there is a leaf called Machipatri which is Artemisia princeps, okay? Which is not there in the Ayurveda text, but which is there in the tradition. What I mean to say, many times we look at the text and we forget about the practices. Both are important when we look at the traditional knowledge. And uh, even at, at a very subtle level, you want to look at how to differentiate the species, they're entirely different. What I'm trying to do by showing all these things, so this is something what I want to share with you. What is it basically? Damanaka is uh, actually not mentioned in any of the original texts which we call Brahatrayi, Chark, Shushtut, and Vagbhat, the major text. Bhav Mishra for the first time mentioned as Damana, not as Damanaka. We should be very precise. Damanatu, Damanavat kaha Damanaka. If at all anybody uses the word Damanaka, it is a different species of Artemisia. Damana is the name. Then, uh, it is a uh, quotation was uh, given by Kshir, Dr. Kshir Sagar also. It is there in Bhav Prakash Nikantu. K.C. Chunekarji identified this was Artemisia vulgaris. Okay. Then in Madanapal Nikantu, under Karpuraj Varga, Damana was not mentioned for the first time. Madana word has been used. And uh, this is uh, equated to again uh, this Artemisia vulgaris. So if we compare Damana and Madana, Brotre did not mention Madana. And Madana is only found in Madan Palligant, which is a 16th, 17th century text. But in the Danvantar Nigantu, which is 10th century AD, Shodal Nigantu, 12th century, Bhav Prakash, 16th, 17th, Madan, uh, again, 16th, 17th, this uh, particular thing is mentioned. But there are other things which have been denoted uh, with the word Madana. We should be very careful. Then when we use uh, uh, another text, 18th century text called Rajanigantu, the Madana is the synonym of many more plants. So it gives us a scope. It doesn't give a confusion. It gives us a scope. That means Indians were using more and more uh, this thing and the synonym, significant synonym of Gandotkata may be used as a tool, like uh, where we find maximum volatile oils may be a point which can give you uh, which should be Damana. <laughs> That's something. Let us look at it. And then, the another important thing, when a herb Chauhara is mentioned, we get carried away. This is uh, Angelia Glocka is Chauhara for many. But you carefully look at it. Chauhara is nothing but your Artemisia Martima, which is also a 
regularly use herb but uh, we are carried away with another thing if you look at the descriptions uh, is comparison with the avanica and other things probably that might have uh, uh, made us to look at uh, angelica glaca otherwise it is uh, a species of artemisia so there are a lot of biological activities like anti spasmodic anti oxidant anti tumor anti inflammatory we will be talking more about anti tumor and lot many compounds are there so when we look at the species of our interest let us look at the species which has the highest concentration let us look at alternate species so artemisia uh when you look at uh, the species we need not worry uh, that uh, whether uh, we are using the absinthium or not and if the absinthium is our concern yes it is an indian herb like uh, i'll give my example when i was working on uh, piper uh, uh, chaba or uh, retrofactum uh, many people uh, uh, said no it is not there in the literature and uh, in the end i found them in uh, andaman nicobar in kerala and we reported it and today there about 3000 uh, acres are under cultivation and same is the case with uh, some of the other uh, piper species and even picoriza kurova there is another species called picoriza tungana they reported by colonel chopra in 54 and initially q did not agree with me i published uh, this article last year april in nelambo which is the biennial journal of uh, botanical survey of india and rest is history kadiar sir uh, knows about this and uh, the team of uh, three directors from us pharmacopeia herbal medicine company visited my lab they have seen the dna fingerprint and they agreed and today the monograph is having two species that means we are creating more and more avenues than redundant approach add more alternate species okay these are the studies a lot of studies are available on each of the species there are more or less similar that's what i want to say absinthium vulgaris Uh, your uh, martima and then anua anua is something different with the highest uh, concentration of artemisinin may differentiate and it is a chinese species which is not abundantly uh, found in uh, uh, indian continent and now let us look at anti inflammatory just i am trying to show you let us not uh, rework on this the artemisia aspen uh, absinthum and its anti inflammatory properties on various models Uh, are available right from 1992 okay we have sufficient documentation including the chemistry okay right and the the diversity has been covered okay including the other species now here i am showing some of the other species which have been covered so it is a wonderful anti inflammatory agent any anti inflammatory agent as we all know it can be uh, further screened as an antiviral further screen your anti cancer property further screen you do your uh, uh, anti asthmatic property so you have sufficient leads and it's up to you in which direction uh, you want to move and that's all uh, what i want to share uh, just if you have a formulation at your end for that whatever is required you can do otherwise the literature supports you have sufficient evidence Uh, for this particular uh, herb uh, which is uh, the topic for discussion today i uh, thank you one and all for this time thank you that was excellent thank you dr shastri sorry i was muted thank you dr shastri next we will hear from dr vong true he served at, as the ceo of oncotelic incorporated and is an expert in pharmaceutical development. He has been a leader in several prominent biotech companies and institutions including president and CEO of Igdrasol, CSO and board director of Sorrento Therapeutics, board director of Senomed and director of cardiovascular biology at Parker Hughes Institute. Dr. Chu holds a PhD in microbiology. He's a member of Endo, ASCO, AACR and many other professional organizations. Dr. True is widely published and has over 100 patent applications and 39 issued US patents. Welcome Dr. Vong True. Well, thank you Jennifer. Thank you everyone uh, this uh, distinguished panel member. So today I would like to talk about something that we all hold dear with ethnobiology drug development uh, for COVID-19. not only for covid-19 but also an opportunity to develop drug 
extracting from our uh, ethnobiology uh, of the drug for future uh, pandemics. Just a quick overview of uh, the company. Um, Mation has three different distinct segments. We have the Ponder AI group, which is supercomputing capability that sit on your desktop and run the same speed as the Watson IBM. And we have Oncotelic focusing on anti-sense drug, targeting any uh, DNA molecule. We can shut down any protein, any expression, any molecule we want to using anti-sense technology. And the target is really TGIP beta. Uh, it is a central molecule in a, a, a lot of diseases. And right now our focus is developing our lead uh, drug candidate OT101, um, a TJ beta antisense against COVID-19, as well as artemisinin, artemisia, as a TJ beta inhibitor against COVID-19. Now just to quickly talk about what the conventional COVID-19 response program that we are seeing, use leveraging on what uh, we know about drug development. You take millions of compounds that you screen in silico, then in vitro, and then test it in animal. Out of that, you probably get maybe uh, 10 compounds that are uh, suitable to move through clinical trial, phase one, phase two, and phase three. And at the end, you get one molecule that approves as a drug. So that's a labor intensive process. It takes 10 years to develop one drug and at some time up to a billion dollars before you get a drug approved. Uh, but for this COVID-19 program, we, we have seen trillions of dollars already spent on the program. And so far uh, we haven't seen any therapeutic insight. So this approach has failed us in this pandemic. And we really need to look at something else that will allow us to combat this um, COVID-19 and future pandemic. Just take a look at what been going on in, in terms of looking at uh, drug molecule from our arsenal allopathic medicines, to see which one can combat COVID-19. You see many more failure than success. In fact, we only have one success. Uh, that's the dexamethasone for anti-inflammatory against uh, COVID-19, proven to be effective in, in the recovery trial. But if you look at WHO solidarity trial, the UK recovery trial, lopinavir uh, fail, aroxochloroquine fail, remdesivir fail, interferon fail, and also there's a lot of interest um, initially on the cytokine storm, everyone feeling that COVID-19 triggered cytokine storm and therefore you should focus on blocking the cytokine storm. But we have failure of the interleukin-6 receptor. We have the failure of anti-interleukin-1. So that, that didn't pan out. And there's also now focusing on uh, convalescent plasma antibody against the spike protein. And the blaze tube trial uh, shown that um, antibody against spike protein didn't work. And India plastic trial uh, shown that convalescent plasma didn't work. So really all the molecule that tested that very specific molecule and they fail, except for dexamethasone, which is an old drug that is very nonspecific, and it actually worked. So that really suggests to you that uh, focusing on allopathic medicine that being developed from million of compounds that you screen down to one may not be the right approach. And we need to look to other medicine branch, such as the Ayurvedic branch, for medicine that will be able to combat uh, emerging virus uh, very quickly. Here, I would like to uh, explain the plus and minus of this conventional pathway. Uh, there's a plus and minus. Uh, it's a highly bureaucratic and expensive infrastructure. It costs a lot of time and a lot of money to run a clinical trial. You, have, you get IRB approval, you get regulatory approval, you get the import per permit, all that. Uh, drive you up the wall. 
but for example, the solidarity trial is really the fastest trial that was ever conducted. Uh, and WHO ran that trial very well. The concept started in February, March, they got the protocol and March, they launched the protocol. In June, they shown the ACQ fail and in November, they shown that remdesivir fail. So the bottom line with this large clinical trial is that show conclusively whether the drug is working or not. But the focus really is singular focus on one drug for one disease. And that way, this drug that developed for the disease may not be able to reposition when we, we're facing with a novel infectious disease. And most importantly, during the, the pandemic, uh, there's a lot of pressure to show that something is working. And I think regulatory authority keep making mistakes on saying that something is working when it's not actually working, such as remdesivir. Remdesivir is probably the biggest mistake uh, regulatory authority has. It doesn't work, and yet we are pushing this drug onto the population with have low resources and can't really afford the high price of remdesivir. So let's, what is the alternate approach? Alternate approach really to uh, look at ethnobiology, what we have already learned from the past, and really um, mask, social distancing, all that we know from previous uh, epidemic. And Damanaka, so the art of missing from uh, the ethnobiology approach. Why ethnobiology is important? The important here is instead of screening millions of molecules, we're leveraging on the fact that plants have to have an immune system to fight off uh, viral infections, bacteria infection. So they create this secondary metabolite, this molecule that is there to combat uh, these um, pathogens. And human came along and start using this drug to treat uh, diseases that uh, inflict uh, mankind. And that become the rich uh, ethnobiology um, knowledge that we gather over millennia. And if you can leverage on that, you can put the drug uh, rapidly into um, human and stop the pandemic. So what was the plus and minus of Ayurvedic pathway? Manufacturing is the, to me the main problem. Quite a few of the commercial, uh, commercially available formulation contain toxic material that we need to make sure that it's not there. And on, also it's very difficult to run clinical trial per strict Ayurvedic principle. And we really need to have strong clinical trial to show that the drug is working. But the strength, like I said, is eons of co-evolution of these molecules. So really what we need to do going forward is to strengthen composition manufacturing clinical testing and Ayurvedic text need to be updated. For example, what, what we'd like to look at, one, one good example here is artemisinin versus artemisinin. Artemisinin is a defense molecule that the plant made. It has broad um, activity against, it has activity against fibrosis, atherosclerosis, uh, against uh, virus, parasites. When allopathic medicine take artemisinin and create molecule analog of artemisinin to specifically target malaria. So you end up with molecule that very specific to ma malaria, but may not have the broad spectrum activity of artemisinin. So in terms of Damanaka, we already talked about Damanaka, all our distinguished guests already present that. So I'm gonna skip this slide. But the active component of Damanaka, uh, artemisinin, and it is a strong TJ beta inhibitor. And we found that it had suppression of COVID-19 with microgram level. And more importantly, it has safety index of greater than 140. This is important because you're hearing a lot of herbal uh, product, product uh, herbal concoction made that have EC50 against the virus, but really the safety index that you have to worry about. Because if you, on this assay, if you put the drug onto the cell, 
you kill off the cell, of course, you're not going to see the virus. So that's one thing to pay attention to. Um, so that's what happened when the herb extract, when we test the herb extract, it has no antiviral activity, primarily because the um, active component is such a small amount in the herb extract. You really need to purify it and bring that out. And the fact that the molecule is TK beta inhibitor, we feel with our research on OT101 and TJ beta and COVID-19, it will be able to combat the COVID-19 uh, as, uh, as an antiviral, but also to suppress the symptoms associated with COVID-19. So just quickly, I'm just gonna walk you through what is uh, what we feel is the cause of the symptom in COVID-19, this TJ beta surge. We see TJ beta surge uh, it increased in uh, mild, moderate, and severe COVID-19. And this surge is responsible for uh, the symptom that you see in COVID-19. COVID-19 has a broad spectrum of symptoms that don't seem to relate to one another. But if you link them all under TJ beta, you see that they all uh, control by that mass master molecule, TJ beta. For example, increased TJ beta cause um, Recruitment of neutrophil caused in thrombosis, inflammation. It upregulate into leukin six, which people mistaken to be the cytokine storm, but it caused in uh, systemic inflammation. It upregulate TJ beta inducible protein, which caused vascular inflammation. It caused um, IgA class switching, so that you have Kawasaki syndrome and vasculitis. And it block inact so that you have fluid accumulation in the lung. And pneumonia, and more importantly, it activates the fibroblast to cause uh, scarring of the lung. So, so that's why just, well, to bring us all back is why is it that we need to focus on Ayurvedic medicine uh, versus allopathic medicines? Uh, we get, we all get excited about allopathic medicine. This drug molecule is very potent, but we have to understand the cost. Um, in this pandemic, when you want to have a prophylactic that treat everyone to blow, slow down the pandemic, you can't afford a $2,000 uh, drug per person. That will cost us 2.7 trillion just for India and 15 trillion for the, all the world. Whereas if you focus on Ayurved Ayurvedic medicine, you can say $1, that it, it's just a fraction of that cost. And that becomes realistic. Well, you can combat this pandemic realistically with this drug. So with that, I would like to uh, stop and say that right now there are two branches of medicine. The allopathic medicine is not agile enough to respond to a pandemic. We need to have reduction in bureaucratic regulation, but the medicine need to be delivered holistically so that you're treating the patient as a whole, not Here's the pill, take it uh, and hope your uh, disease go away. Ayurvedic medicine has always embraced the holistic approach, but the formulation that Ayurvedic medicine come up with are too complex for us to manufacture properly. So we need to reduce the complexity of the formulation through rigorous manufacturing and the clinical, clinical trials to prove that the drug actually working. So together with, between the two branches, we'll have a perfect situation where we have medicine across multiple area to, and we'll be able to treat the patient holistically as an individual and not as a number. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you, Dr. Wong. We'll next be hearing from Mr. Hitesh Windless, who is a managing director of Windless Biotech Private Limited, a private equity backed pharmaceutical contract development and manufacturing organization. Hitesh has over 20 years of experience in founding a family funded startup, building a formulations manufacturing business, raising private equity capital from financial and strategic investors and building a professional organization that ranks among the top five CDMOs of India. He has 14 inventions and nine patents in semiconductor processing and pharma formulations. Welcome, Mr. Winless. Yeah. 
Did we lose it? Are you on mute? Unmute, please. If Hi, um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much. I am indeed honored to be part of this panel. Everyone here is more experienced and has spent uh, several years in uh, mastering Ayurveda as well as uh, mastering allopathic medicines. I want to share my experience. Uh, I came uh, from outside of pharma uh, pharmaceutical and medical sciences. I was a scientist in semiconductor processing. Uh, at Intel and uh, then uh, came back to India to build a pharma company that my family had. So I'm going to talk a little bit about manufacturing challenges and how uh, you know scaling up drug uh, manufacturing limits some of the impact that uh, we want to have uh, through Ayurveda. Just a little bit about Windless Biotech. Um, uh, we have uh, four manufacturing facilities. We manufacture close to about 2 billion dosages in India. Our facilities are approved by Indian regulator as well as US FDA. And uh, many of them are exporting to several uh, ROW markets. In uh, about three years ago, we decided to also uh, get involved in uh, Ayurvedic formulations and uh, started manufacturing of Ayurvedic formulations. And this is where I want to sort of share, uh, you know, my experience um, and uh, what we are trying to do at Windless and specifically with this product. Since there are many colleagues over here who come from uh, allopathic uh, uh, tradition or allopathic uh, science, I want to also mention that as we started looking into manufacturing Ayurvedic products, um, and Ayurvedic sciences, it is a myth that uh, you know the uh, Vedic texts or or the or the practices over at that time uh, were lacking in quality. In fact, uh, I, I note over over here several uh, references where uh, long long and intense discussions have been made on various aspects of quality in manufacturing. I'm not going to go into detail on this. But just as a uh, point, that quality consciousness has always been part of ancient Ayurveda. As we go into, um, you know, scaling up, um, and as as uh, uh, as was mentioned earlier, from uh, making medicine by one physician for one patient uh, to making medicines on a very large scale and uh, maintaining quality standards and ensuring efficacy as well as safety, a lot has been done by the Indian government to uh, facilitate this uh, establishing of uh, guidelines and standards. And a lot is being done. So uh, while there is a you know, movement from a purely traditional approach to using tools of quality to scale up and do large scale manufacturing, there is still work to be done. And this is what I want to share uh, about some aspects of uh, what uh, we uh, at Windless feel are uh, some areas that need to further be strengthened. Uh, a lot of Ayurvedic manufacturing currently in the industry is uh, you know, around quality control principles. Uh, what needs to happen is to bring in uh, uh, principles of quality assurance, which is uh, studying of uh, defects and systematically eliminating them on large volumes to ensure product quality. Uh, the standardization of materials, methods, people, and processes has been started with establishment of uh, you know, the pharmacopoeial methods and several things, but now it needs to be extended validation approach. And uh, you know, uh, this, you know, small things like cleaning validation, what have we made in the factory on that equipment train before this batch was produced? And whether the remnants of that previous product are contaminating this batch. This is very rigorously monitored in allopathic medicine. And the same level of rigor in terms of cleaning validation needs to be brought in in uh, the GMP for Ayurvedic production. 
most a lot of ayurvedic medicines are actually combination products and so stability is not just establishing that the assay method is uh, I, the assay of the drug is available over the shelf life it is actually to also study whether there are any degradation impurities that are growing over this shelf life of uh, you know one or two years and whether there are drug drug interaction happening inside the formulation so uh, this aspect of uh, you know work is fairly new even to the allopathic science we 10 or 15 years ago and needs to be brought in somehow into studying uh, degradation products uh, as uh, you know through stability indicating methods uh, also you know whether a formulation if if it if the bill of materials or if if the components of the formulation are the same can it have the exact same impact you know we need to standardize the dosage and come up with methods to actually compare uh, products coming out which have the same bill of materials but perhaps some nuances that are different whether in the dissolution profile of the product and how the the drug and, and uh, uh, there were some examples given earlier about this finally also it is very important that we are not just looking at uh, you know uh clinical outcomes but establishing the methods of um, or mechanism of action through detailed pharmacokinetic studies and uh, standardizing a one formulation against a established uh, you know uh, product in some way uh, we have at windless have just started this journey and very very proud and happy to uh, you know associate with mation in uh, producing uh, artemisinin Uh, or in a high volume for indian patients and uh, are looking forward to this uh, journey in in transforming and improving patient outcomes thank you thank you very much mr hatesh we'll now hear from dr ravi reddy who is the chief science officer at shri shri tatva he is an ayurveda graduate and researcher who comes with a rich 20 years of experience in the field of ayurveda medicines health supplements and novel formulations in the beauty space. He has a deep knowledge of traditional herbs and their use as per ancient texts and is a specialist in classical Ayurveda and proprietary complex formulations. He actively participates with the Export Promotion Council Board of the Ministry of Ayush, Government of India, to establish product standardization protocols and the recognition of Ayurveda overseas. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you Jennifer. so that uh, good evening for the distinguished delegates katyar ji shastri ji and balram ji and suhas and then the so it's like no it's a privilege to be there on this uh, maybe the my topic assigned to me maybe it's like it's look uh, different from the drug development and the things but as always gurudev says that uh, health is not a mere absence of disease it's a dynamic expression of the life so where like you know the expression of the life that comes by the service and the humanitarian things that also the part of our uh, healing that will happens to the mind and and also it will be promotes that the mental health so it's like uh, always like you know, gurudev says that it's like you no know, healthy mind can take a weak body but not the weak mind can't take the strong body like it's like when the my mind is not very healthy so it's not carry the even the what the strongest body muscle body because it's the that's where it should be nourished and then the healing power that's what we recognize always uh, by the meditation and then the service in the humanitarian things so that will be more emphasized here uh, in my uh, like there has short video that i shared with jennifer that uh, she can present that so th this is the main the thing that so like it's a long journey that happened like uh, i heard a methion coming up uh, this uh, artemisin uh, from saran uh, around 8 months back and it thought like it's a, like no a new molecule that is coming and it's like no addition that is happening so it's a, like no revive for this in the pandemic and then it will be more helpful for the humanitarian things and then the and also the technical aspects like no scientific validation also happens in the like no good uh, mathion housing a scientific validation methods uh, which will uh, improve and uh, increase the like no, uh, acceptance 
in all, all, all over the country. So here it is like where the Shri Tattwa and the Art of Living, which have done a lot of uh, service oriented in this like COVID pandemic times and helping in like you know, meditations and in the uh, mental health of the even the workers, like health workers who are continuously monitoring and also doing the service at the hospitals. They feel like a lot of depression that is happening. So uh, like mainly the Sudarshan Kriya, which is one of the part of the art of living. So they have done a lot of uh, researchers, like the, the way healthcare providers in themselves, like where they will be, they are going into the uh, like distress. So by regularly doing this breathing techniques, they came out of this and then how the lungs got uh, more uh, efficacy in their function by regularly doing the pranayama. So uh, Jennifer, can you present that video? So I mean, I'm not bored much. It's like a you know, lot of presentations we heard that. So we can have a refreshed video about it. I, I will share the video. Um, yeah. Here we go. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Yeah, thank you. In an era when ancient wisdom was buried, under years of ritualistic practices, when games became wars and wars were played like games, a young boy was found in deep meditation in a quaint village in South India known as Ravi Shankar. He would say, I have family everywhere. People are waiting for me. He astonished his teachers by reciting the Bhagavad Gita at a tender age of four. With his education in Vedic literature and physics and his deep and profound knowledge of the spiritual world, he became one of the most prominent sages of the modern world. All through his life, he has been reviving ancient knowledge and creating tools and techniques that have benefited millions across the globe in living a deeper and a more joyous life. In 1981, the Art of Living was established by Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Nurtured by his care and contribution, the Art of Living has rapidly grown across 156 countries, reaching over 450 million people. More people are searching harder for inner peace these days. Would you agree? Correct. One of Gurudev's most unique offerings to the world is the Sudarshan Kriya, a powerful breathing technique that facilitates physical, mental, emotional and social well-being. He has designed 57 exclusive courses that empower individuals and cater to the needs of a wide spectrum of institutions in the society. Back then, Gurudev started the Art of Living service projects by taking responsibility of reviving a sinking school which had no funds. Today, his intention has manifested in over 702 free schools, which provides education and food to more than 80,000 children in rural and tribal parts of India. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Art of Living Foundation pioneered the I Stand with Humanity initiative, providing more than 80 million meals to the daily wage earners in over 170 cities across India. The service initiative during the pandemic included the distribution of 6,000 tons of food to 5 million families. It helped set up seven COVID care hospitals and provided with over 200,000 PPE kits. Trauma relief programs were also conducted for more than 1 million migrant laborers and COVID warriors to bring mental relief. To combat the fear, stress, and anxiety during such times, Gurudev launched the World Meditates campaign and also personally conducted online guided meditations twice daily, touching the lives of millions by bringing solace and keeping the hope alive. From childhood, Gurudev had immense faith in the principle of non violence. With escalating violence and conflict in the world, Gurudev has brought peace in situations where war seemed like the only solution. Thousands of militants and Naxalites laid down their weapons and chose meditation in the Northeast and other parts of India. <laughs> I 
His efforts include bringing an end to a 52-year-old fierce conflict between the FARC and the Colombian government. Ojalá podamos los colombianos abrazar pronto el principio gandiano de la no violencia. Coincidimos con el maestro Chacal. Gurudev has visited Iraq several times and addressed peace conferences to bring respite to the nation and its citizens. He has hosted a series of trust-enhancing interventions in Jammu and Kashmir, providing all the stakeholders to voice their opinions in an effort to restore peace in the valley. I was named Muhammad. But after becoming a militant, I was called Khalid. We had been taught to operate guns, arms, and train other youths. But now, after doing the art of living course and meeting Shishring, we realized we had chosen the wrong path. We now want to spread love and non-violence in Kashmir. Gurudev's programs have impacted people involved in armed conflicts across the world, making him a global ambassador of peace. We gather today in this wonderful occasion of tolerance, blessed by our master of love. Gurudev strongly believes that behind every culprit, there is a victim crying for help. The Art of Living Prison program is helping to rehabilitate the prisoners. It has reached out to over 800,000 prisoners globally and has brought immense transformation in their lives. I actually look forward to fights. But now since doing this cause, the total, I'm a totally different person. I can now walk up. I'm sorry to cut that short, but no, in the interest you, of time. Yeah, it, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, it's thank, it's fine. You, thank you, thank you. Thank you for sharing that video, it was very informative. Yeah. So there it's like, the, we are, uh, again, uh, I can say that it's like out of living, working with, uh, like as a brand of Sri Tattva. So it's having a, a manufacturing facilities at Bangalore, Hyderabad, and also like in Uttaranch. So it's um, uh, GMP facilities and then CGMP and, and PIX GMP uh, qualified facilities. So it's like, um, it's taking up the Ayurveda science in a more uh, a validated method. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. We'll next be hearing from Mr. Saran Sand. Serves at, he serves as the CBO and general manager of the AI division, Mation Therapeutics. As a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, Saran Sand has been a founder, CEO, and GM at startups and public companies and held senior leadership roles at companies that were acquired by leaders such as Marvel and Qualcomm. Welcome, Mr. Sand. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon in the East Coast and good evening in India. Thank you for uh, this uh, wonderful uh, set of delegates and very, very informative. I just wanted to add a couple of words about uh, Dr. Ravi. Uh, he is an eminent uh, Ayurvedic scientist and is the chief scientist uh, at uh, Shri Shri Tatwa and has been working with us from the very beginning on uh, Dhammanaka. And uh, I asked him to present this uh, topic of humanitarian work, but the art of living, because uh, we are in discussions with art of living and we, with the data that we have coming back from our uh, clinical trials with uh, RT Misne, uh, we, we are, um, carrying up our plans to go into commercialization, but uh, we also want to donate uh, millions of these capsules for humanitarian effort. And we couldn't find any better partner than the art of living because of the infrastructure in India and a way to promote through their Ayurvedic uh, physicians. So thank you very much uh, for that uh, uh, introduction to the humanitarian work by the art of living. So Dr. Uh, Vong spoke about the science of uh, Dominica and our uh, TGF beta inhibition um, uh, testing and studies. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about our clinical study uh, and our product. So we've talked about 
uh, Artemisia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shastri, for giving us a full pharmacopoeia of the plant. Um, I wanted to talk about our product. Uh, so Arti Veda is really Artemisia, um, which has been purified. Uh, and, uh, and we have, uh, uh, have a special formulation for easy assimilation. The, uh, the, the hunch we had originally from the ancient texts and what we discovered was that in vitro testing, that it was, uh, it was killing the virus. And, uh, and, and, and it was more effective and uh, showed uh, uh, more safety than uh, remdesivir or hydrochloroquine. So we took the um, stance very early on that this could help address the pandemic. And uh, since then, we have a clinical study that I will talk more about. I think Dr. Vong talked about this uh, quite a lot, but uh, essentially, uh, we have uh, uh, discovered that the, although we do have an allopathic drug that is going through a clinical trial, and we are finding that the ability for us to move through the regulatory pathway has been a lot quicker and with a safe uh, uh, compound like uh, Artemisia. I do want to bring up um, how we want to blend Ayurvedic and uh, scientific rigor. So for example, uh, there are 400 uh, trials registered in the CTRI in India. And uh, of them, 70 are active. Of the 70 that are active that are enrolling patients, half of them are Ayurvedic, most of which are Ayurvedic therapeutic. But not one of these have, a, have done a study in vitro with a cell assay and been able to demonstrate uh, the activities. So I would urge our Ayurvedic friends to take on the discipline of doing some of the in vitro testing, in vivo testing prior to uh, doing a clinical study. And also many of the clinical studies did not have a control arm. These are things that we have, um, we have uh, conducted ourselves. So we just wanted to share that some of these best practices of, a, um, of scientific rigor are really important for, uh, for the Ayurvedic industry to be able to establish itself and promote uh, around, not only in India, where it's taken root for thousands of years, but also in the rest of the world. So our study, which is uh, ongoing right now, is a, it's an open label study, interventional with the Dominica 500 milligram capsules for the safety and efficacy in treatment of adult subjects. We have uh, three sites today in uh, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh with uh, 120 subjects of which we have randomized so far uh, between 30 and 40 patients. Uh, with the, uh, the uh, projection of this disease, we are now expanding to six sites and uh, increasing to 300 subjects. This is a global effort uh, with our partnership with Windless in India, where we think we can make the biggest uh, dent in the pandemic, uh, but we are also opening up a uh, clinical study in Nigeria to address the African uh, epidemic, as well as in Peru as a kickstart for, uh, for Latin America. So as I was saying, it's an open label with a control arm, a multi-center randomized phase four study. Phase four is important because Dominica as Artemisia absinthinium has been available, uh, like Dr. Shastri was mentioning, in the, uh, in the lower foothills of Himalayas, not only in the West, but also in Assam and Sikkim, it's a uh, available uh, uh, product. So we don't have to go through a phase one, two, three, four. In fact, uh, 
uh, Mr. Hitesh uh, would have uh, mentioned to you that he has already acquired a license to manufacture and we are accelerating because of the good positive clinical data, our, our, uh, our manufacturing plans, which is to distribute it as a Ayurvedic uh, herbal compound, as well as a nutraceutical uh, through the various channels, but also uh, as a humanitarian relief for donation through an NGO like Art of Living. So the, the clinical trial in India is proceeding very smoothly. Uh, it compares the efficacy of an oral dose uh, with standard of care versus standard of care alone. This is an important distinction because uh, as we conduct the study and the drug's efficacy is proven, it is important for the drug to be taken in conjunction with the existing SOCs. Uh, many trials tend to do a them and, them and us kind of attitude, which is, uh, um, uh, which is an Ayurvedic drug versus SOC, but it should really be Ayurvedic drug plus SOC in one arm versus the control arm of, of an SOC. In our case, the SOCs are the clinical management protocol today, which is vitamin C and in moderate cases, remdesivir and other uh, antibiotics uh, that are prescribed by the physicians. Uh, so we are focused on the mild and moderate cases, uh, WHO scale two, three, and four, and we are skewing more towards the moderate cases. Uh, it's important to mention from a product perspective, RT Veda, it'll be an oral dose. Uh, the protocol is uh, five pills in five days, one pill per day. And uh, if the symptoms remain, then after a waiting period of five days, you repeat the cycle. Uh, now think about this. So if you look at allopathic medicines like remdesivir or others like it, uh, you have to be in the hospital, you have to be infused, and the availability and the plentiful supply of being able to promote and distribute a product like this is uh, incredible from a uh, usability point of view. So if you happen to be a patient, in fact, uh, I'll share a story about my friend Hitesh, when he had a, uh, um, uh, he, when he was infected uh, recently, uh, the beauty is without having to get tested positive because of the safety index, the patient can start the dosage immediately. It's, uh, it's safe, it's been around for uh, mill millennia. So before you even get a positive test, you can start taking the dosage, one pill a day for five days. And if the test is negative, um, well, that's no issue, right? Because uh, uh, it's safe, you can stop taking it and do whatever the physician suggests you should do for whatever the symptoms are. So I'm very happy to share that uh, we are about uh, maybe a third of the way through uh, in our clinical trial. And uh, what we are sharing with you is um, the very first uh, trends of the efficacy of our data. So you will, if you look at the table on the right-hand side, so we are comparing the SOC versus the SOC with RT Veda. So if you look at the days two, three, and four, what you really see is a, think of it as a bell curve, right? If you look at just the SOC alone, the bell curve is more towards the middle and to the right, where the recovery is happening for the mild and moderate patients. And if you look at the RT Veda cohort, the bell curve actually starts moving to the left. So the patients are recovering sooner and faster and, and quicker. And this has a very important uh, aspect, which I'll cover in a slide. But essentially, uh, what it's doing is that it's, it's uh, treating the disease and uh, as an antiviral quicker and sooner. And uh, that improves the amount of time spent in the hospital. It improves the infectivity, the R0. In, in other words, how many people this one person can infect. And so overall, the picture becomes uh, very positive to being able to address the pandemic. Um, and the second two rows, what we're showing is how these, uh, these 31 randomized patients, we extrapolated 
to 120, which proves to us that the 120 uh, patients that in the first study is uh, going to be statistically significant. So it's uh, still very early days. We're still gathering the study. It's looking very positive, but um, uh, we are now expanding to 300 patients and we'll be expanding to 3000 patients globally. Uh, the other um, important side note here is that today we have not uh, observed any safety signals. Uh, none of the patients have gone into uh, adverse uh, uh, conditions. The next slide I wanted to share with you is a independent study not connected to us, which corroborates uh, the potent activity of uh, the uh, artemisinin as an antiviral. So this study, which was conducted uh, under the auspices of the and published under the University of Tulane, is uh, the is the control arm is uh, hydrochloroquine uh, versus the treatment arm, which is artemisinin plus uh, uh, pipraquinine, which is a form of quinoline. So when you think about it. It's really primarily artemisinin rather than uh, uh, piperquinine, which is uh, this combination was designed for malaria. So it, it's, it's been approved for malaria. So the team that did the clinical study had to use both because it was approved. But essentially, if you think about the pathway of uh, piperquinine uh, from a malarial point of view, which is very different from the artemisinin for COVID. So the study that they have uh, uh, just completed is, um, is quite groundbreaking and, uh, and uh, very thrilling and exciting news for us uh, because it, it demonstrates that uh, artemisinin is actually acting as an antiviral, not just impacting the symptoms alone. And it has an effect of almost 50% in the ability to kill the virus in these patients compared to the control arm. Also, the study demonstrated that the uh, hospital stay was, was cut almost in by 40%. So this has some massive implications in being able to control the pandemic. And uh, this slide summarizes the, pan the, the, the point that we're trying to make. The point we are trying to make is that we can stop the pandemic. Why? There are multiple ways we can think about, about how the pandemic can be addressed. One is you have a miracle drug, a vaccine, uh, like the one that was just announced by, or just uh, shared uh, by Pfizer. Uh, there are downsides to vaccines. Uh, many people don't take it. Uh, it can cause the virus to mutate. So that's one way. Uh, the second way is uh, uh, herd immunity which uh, unfortunately has the side effect of uh, uh, millions of uh, lives lost to get to that point. And then the third is with intervention. So what you see on the top in the, in the top uh, part of the slide is without intervention. So uh, without intervention, the bell curve is more to the right, which has uh, fatalities and peak hospital hospitalized which means that uh, many people who wind up in the hospitals, uh, uh, some percentage of them are actually going to die. So the mortality rate is high. This is based on the CDC model of R0, which is 2.2. Uh, what that means is if uh, you're infected, you have now the infectivity, you can infect 2.2 people around you. So with the studies that we were just presented, uh, with intervention, like the one we are proposing, if you move this bell curve to the left and the R0 could drop to one or less than one, you, you can actually stop the pandemic dead in its tracks because an infected person, uh, the number of infected people drop dramatically and the number of people they can infect drops dramatically. So you can actually stop the pandemic and stop the virus from growing. The side effect of a TGF-beta mechanism of action like the one we are proposing is that 
even though the virus can mutate because it's a secondary impact of inhibiting, of uh, killing the TGF beta that it's uh, inducting to replicate. Uh, the virus can mutate. So our theory and hypothesis is that a TGF beta inhibition can actually prevent the uh, COVID-19 despite the uh, virus uh, mutating. So um, I would want to just end with a couple of more slides. Um, this one is very important uh, for all of us, which is uh, Prakriti medicine. So as we've discussed uh, in, by the previous uh, uh, speakers, that uh, Ayurveda is a very holistic medicine. I love this quote from Hippocrates, which, is, which says, it's far more important to know what person has the disease than what disease the person has. So in Ayurveda, we, we treat the person holistically. The individual uh, prakriti, which is the, uh, the unique uh, composition of the human with the uh, medicine that is being prescribed for the medicine, which is the dravya guna panchak. So rasa, guna, virya, vipaka, uh, prava, prabhava. So I'm not an expert in Ayurveda, so please forgive me. Uh, but uh, I'm sure all our eminent um, speakers here understand this extremely well. And how to then take Ayurveda into the next generation of Ayur genomics. So there's now so many omics happening at the uh, proto-omics level, at the genomics levels. How do we uh, combine the two for a pluralism well, from the Ayurvedic side and the uh, scientific side? The implication is that COVID-19 is actually a very complex uh, mechanism requiring a drug cocktail. So the uh, goal for us is to treat uh, this as a personalized treatment with the right dose, the right drug for the right patient using con conjunction of Ayurveda with scientific vigor. I want to end on the personalization angle because Mation, uh, my background is more Silicon Valley. And so uh, Mation uh, merged and we uh, merged my artificial intelligence company with Mation. So we are a combination of a biotech and AI company. So on the uh, theme of personalization, we are, we are developing an AI technology. It is a mobile application. So think about this. The patient can be at home uh, taking a pill or uh, uh, recovering from the, from the disease, and they will be able to uh, speak or cough or exhale into a, an app on their mobile phone. And the AI will be able to detect the level of uh, disease. Uh, is it a wet cough? Is it a dry cough? Is there, uh, uh, um, are they having breathing difficulties? It's a bit like a spirometer, but it's virtual and it's a mobile app. So we are in the process of putting this uh, 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 product together and we will be taking it with our clinical trials through the uh, RT Veda clinical trials where the patients that are taking the pills will also be able to uh, present their cough sounds which will then be used by AI to train the systems so that in the future, uh, the patient can download the app on their mobile phone and to be able to track their own personal journey uh, of tracking the disease. Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Because they can continuously monitor their, uh, their lung capacity, their respiratory functions. And, uh, and to be able to then share that information with their physician in case their treatment requires uh, adjustments. So this is very futuristic. So we are trying to blend very ancient uh, and we're talking thousands of years of ancient uh, Sanskrit texts, Ayurveda, uh, the mindfulness and the meditations of uh, ancient Indian uh, uh, modalities with modern science, uh, genomics, and uh, uh, even uh, pharmaceutical science. And now the next generation, which is artificial intelligence, 
where a lot of this personalization convergence can happen. So with that, uh, uh, this is my last slide. <clears throat> I, I just mentioned all these things. We are working with IBM in being able to deploy this technology. And I just want to thank uh, all our panelists and uh, to Dr. Suhas for bringing this uh, incredible uh, team together and all the audience and, uh, and uh, Dr. Balramji, uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Reddy, uh, Dr. Shekhar, Dr. Katyar, Dr. Shastri. And we hope to continue this discussion on a series of uh, e equally important Ayurvedic uh, uh, convergence topics down the road. And I thank, thank all the uh, people who have attended our, uh, our webinar. And we hope to see you soon on this. And thank you, Jennifer, for keeping us on time and bringing this whole thing together. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you, Saran. Um, and thank you, our esteemed panelists, for sharing both your knowledge and your time today. I think we all learned a lot. We do have some questions. If people want to stick around for some questions that we have, um, the first one is: the metals used in the production of drugs are, are the metals used in the production of drugs safe, especially lead? Does somebody want to take that? Dr. Katia or Dr. Balram Singh? Yeah, yeah. I, I will, I will take it up. Yeah, yeah. They are safe because. Uh, uh, lead is not used as a lead. It has to undergo multiple series of processes, are shodhan and maran and incineration, uh, so that by the time it is used in the product, it is not the lead what we know as lead. It's a compound, and that is quite safe. That's why I shared the toxicity studies of some of the products where lead was also component in that. So uh, it is depending upon the processes. Ayurved, uh, as per Ayurved, which means poison can be used as a medicine, medicine can, and the food can also be a poison. If used inappropriately, if used appropriately, even the poison is a drug. And Ayurved used so many metals, mercury, lead, arsenic, all of them. But after proper processing, and that makes it... Uh, Detoxified. Okay. Can, can, you, uh, can, I, can I add one point to this? Sure. I, I would like to add one point. Uh, it will be interesting for everybody who feel themselves as scientists. Open any toxicology text in modern medicine. Uh, arsenic as element is non-toxic. Copper as element is non-toxic. It's from, I'm quoting from the modern toxicology text. Okay, now what's the problem? The, the problem are the salts. Okay, and we forget. Are we using the right techniques? Yesterday also I was speaking on one occasion. In the Sapper's paper, we have, they have used XRF. If you go to US, uh, the, the, what you call the regulatory uh, bodies and find out, XRF is not used for testing any of the drugs. Why did they allow this to study? It is used in plastic industry in US context. It is a blunder. And if you look at the LOD and LOQ of the equipment used, you go to the reference. It is a fabricated paper, if you ask me, as a proper critic, scientific critic. And the, the limitation of the instrument is uh, uh, the, the more than five PPB. So when it is one PPB, why are you using an equipment which is five PPB? and rubbish. So what I want to say, it is a com complex uh, chemistry between three. Ligand chemistry is a triangle formed by one arm ligand chemistry, the other form colloidal chemistry, and then the base nano chemistry. These three components together. So XRD, which is highly individual dependent uh, procedure, which is where, where we do not have expertise, we are trying to shift the onus somewhere and we are trying to blame the system then agreeing that we do not have a, a fit for purpose process. We do not have, the scientists across the globe should accept this or they should give me the XRD reports. We have given this to many institutes and they failed to give a proper report 
say what is the complex uh, this uh, organo inorgano complex forming after this uh, this thing calcium initiative technology we have done two bhasma studies amazing they are in the nano state so at nano state even you are in nano silver in nano iron why are not allowing the alternative systems to do the same a simple question that's it perfect thank you dr shastri along those same lines as another question how do you define purity and impurity in ayurvedic drug production i understand this is part of quality determination of a product this is for dr katyar yeah there's a so purity and impurity that's called as there's something called shodhan process so shodhan uh, uh, i hope i am interpreting correctly uh, the question Uh, purity and impurity means shuddh ashuddh means shodhan process and uh, uh, every industry so as per the law as per the law also and the pharmacopeia also recommend that uh, no toxic substances or herbs which are listed cannot be used without subjecting them to a detoxification process actually detoxification not the right word it does much more than that so uh, the the herb which are toxic becomes not only non toxic their their uh, uh, pharmacological profile also changes drastically after the process so there are methods of chemistry their chemical composition changes and uh, their biology can also be tested by the pharmacological method and a minimum uh, lot of people have kind of have done researches and lot of papers are already published on Uh, shodhan and uh, 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 without shodhan and shodhan comparative studies so uh, there are uh, chemical processes there are chemical tests which are used to know whether the product is shodhan or is being after shodhan or not for example you take strychnax nakvomica which is a fine it will contain strychnine which is the uh, cause of uh, worry because that kills but if the it is shodhan is done then strychnine is almost negligible gone and it remains only in ppm quantities from milligram to ppm that's the the difference and that can be tested there are pharmacopeial methods for that so it can be tested perfect perfect thank you and also even selecting the right ones with the with the right. pure herbs means fingerprinting and using the right yes. herbs to start the production itself so there's a whole system that you use and the good question Jennifer anything more thank you yes this is for dr singh the environment is changing every day so how do you relate the old theory compared to modern times so yeah i i think thank you thank you i think that's that's a very common question people ask and sometimes people get confused what i was trying to say is that you know the when i said dincharya ritucharya there is a circadian rhythm Uh, there is a, a you know we know in modern biology as we age you have different kind of things so we always change uh, it's not like we don't change we just need to make keep a balance and balance with the environment and balance within us and that's what i think the when when our own prakriti becomes uh, unbalanced that the create in vikriti and the disease but this can be uh, controlled and in coordination with the prakriti outside so i think it's it's a dynamic process it's not a one thing is fixed and the other one is changing but i think um, the the solution to that is also biodiversity is because we are talking about plants and herbs but the potency comes from the quality of the soil and the purity of the natural elements so we go around the globe selecting them maybe from amazon or foothills of himalayas or something it does boil down to the quality of the air and the water and the sunlight and the soil itself so i think uh, that is what is more important because the medicinal properties and dr shastri knows this very well because the medicinal plants wherever they are cultivated how they are cultivated their efficacy comes from mother earth itself and restoring and maintaining that in order for the next generation i think that is the key well just to add to that one i think there's very important theory of ayurveda is that things should be more mostly local so that i adds to the uh, attest to what dr shishagar is saying that it's very important that and this will probably not fit exactly with the uh, the corporate the corporate world where they want to get everything in one place and and do all this in this kind of a distribution of the whole healthcare 
uh, which is, I think, we should be committed to because that's a very important part of Ayurveda. Yeah, I, I, I will add one point here. Like, like uh, uh, recently we started enlightening and uh, today we had a wonderful session with one of the government officials uh, at a policy level. Uh, we have requested them just to get away from uh, the 15 agroclimatic zones. These zones are pulses and cereals. Now, uh, Kashmir to Kanyakumari, we cultivate uh, wheat and rice. Maybe the variety may change, but the species doesn't change. But it comes to Pushkar Mool, Inela Rasi Moza, you can't uh, cultivate any of the southern states. <laughs> and you can't cultivate uh, some of the Al uh, Alpinia Galanga and other species, or even uh, your Combifera Vitae in any of the alpine zones. <laughs> okay, the geoclimatic uh, conditions should take over from the agroclimatic conditions. That's the fundamental change. And second thing, the diversities. The interspecies diversities, endemic species doesn't have the diversity, whereas the, the other species have a lot of uh, interspecies diversity. And unless and until we understand this, we, we will be monotonous and then uh, we fail to appreciate. Shushrut mentioned in his text, which is a wonderful observation and it's very tough for any scientist to follow this. Just I'll give that and I stop myself here. The Ushnavirya Dravyas are to be taken from south and the Sitavirya are from Himalayas. Seldom you get a Sitavirya Dravya from Himalaya. Out of 100, you get one or two. Now, this is one research area for an entire uh, decade. And it, it, it raises eyebrows for many. But when we looked at it, there is a reason. We can uh, discuss as a different forum. And then the same is the case with the Vishnavira Dravyas coming from south. So these things, very small things which have been mentioned in the text, like uh, rightly mentioned by Balram Singh, So <laughs> it is very specific. Uh, endemic species to be given in one particular area, depending upon maybe the genomics. Uh, and uh, companion species, I, I, I conclude myself, in a, this uh, Karkatsungi is not farming in Himachal Pradesh in those areas where wheat is not being cultivated. Please go to this area. Last three years we are doing this study and today I make this uh, open statement. I was sharing it with uh, Director uh, ISBT, ISBT uh, last week. Wheat, wheat cultivation has been stopped and uh, your uh, Karkatsungi, the gal formation has come down. Can we correlate? And nature is speaking to each other, these plants, and we are ignoring that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank Come you. On. So the last question is um, for uh, Mr. Hatesh. Could you please elaborate on why you think Ayurvedic drugs shall be used in conjunction with standard of care? Yeah, I think this is a, this goes uh, essentially uh, back to basic uh, patient safety aspects, right? When you're evaluating a drug in a clinical trial, if you don't give the comparative arm, the standard of care, right, you can deprive them and potentially risk their safety, uh, even to the extent of death. So uh, you always have to give standard of care. And then, uh, you know, uh, when we are evaluating Ayurvedic drug, uh, we are giving that as an uh, adjunct therapy to that. As evidence mounts and as we get uh, surer and surer, then with the ethical committees, a trial can be created where this is the only alternative. But at this point, it is it would be irresponsible uh, to the patients to not give them standard of care while the drug is still being, efficacy is being, still being established. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you all for participating. The recording will be on our website for uh, attendees and anybody who would like access to it, it will be on our website soon after. Uh, I would just want to add one more thing to uh, the previous discussion that, uh, you know, uh, the points that Dr. Shastri and Dr. Katyar made are even, we are finding them true to even be for uh, artemisinin uh, in our case, where in vitro testing on some, uh, you know, uh, incorrectly uh, processed artemisinin showed uh, zero activity against the virus, against the COVID-19 virus. So, uh, so it is very, very important as, as highlighted uh, by uh, you know, honorable speakers that uh, processing plays a very, very important role. And this is something that 
um, where Windlers and Mation have worked quite a bit to establish the right process in making sure that um, the way it is done is uh, preserving the activity of the art masonry. How, how pure is that art masonry? So uh, for us, uh, the purity for art masonry is one thing, sir. It, uh, we are doing somewhere between 98 to 99% pure art masonry. But, uh, and, and uh, you know, all the heavy metals and all are, are part of the specification. But even pure art masonry processed at uh, certain temperature zones, in uh, you know in in the extraction process resulted in uh, rim, you know completely zero activity in in vitro so structural change perhaps okay may may i uh, add to it yes sir please uh, on the in vitro testing uh, i have got a learning and my learning is in in vitro you are exposing your product directly to the enzyme or to whatever you want, right? But it does not happen in the real life situation. For example, if you are testing in vitro for against the virus itself, you are exposing it directly, but does it happen in the body also? No, you take a drug, it gets metabolized, its metabolites go to the blood and those metabolites are exposed to the uh, this virus or anything, whatever, you, I, enzyme or body, anything. So therefore, yeah. so so therefore, therefore, never get carried away. So, Sometimes these in vitro can lead you to the wrong direction. The right way is to do at least uh, if you get very potent activity to get confirmation, always do X, Y, O. What is X, Y, O? Give this product to a rat for seven to 10 days. And then use the serum of the rat to see whether its treat is showing effect. If it is showing, then your product is really working. If it is not showing, then be sure that something is happening in the liver and liver is metabolizing all the active compounds. Yeah, I, learned it, uh, I learned it very hard. I learned it very hard in my life in drug discovery while I was ran back. See, uh, and, uh, and when we did this, all the results altered. So this I am sharing my learning. Thank yeah, Dr. Katya, I, I will also share my experience here. We did the same thing, like salicin, salix capria and yeah. salix alba. Uh, they are known uh, painkillers in uh, traditional medicine. Uh, we have taken the standard extracts, which, which is having 25% uh, salicin from Europe. Yeah. And we have given for the cell lines and we have given to the animal. We have taken uh, when we observed the peak plasma levels mm. of uh, salicylic acid and we found the same results and we did it with the uh, anacyclus pyrethrum and we did it with nutmeg yeah. so if you identify few compounds and uh, track it you're absolutely right uh, th this is the right approach you are counter checking you know our cell model yeah, yeah, yeah. cell lines yeah. are indicators they, they are more than mm -hmm. uh, the indication they don't have a uh, much role to play perfect perfect thank you so i think yeah. i greatly appreciate on behalf of mate and everybody's presence uh, brilliant minds and we would absolutely need your help and support to make sure that Artiveda gets into the right hands very soon. We're conducting the uh, clinical trials and very soon we'll be expanding those trials. So uh, I would definitely seek everybody's guidance uh, to see how we can get this to the right people in the right of time. Uh, I think uh, Hitesh is uh, ready with the manufacturing license and he'll be producing dosages of Artiveda very soon. And uh, uh, Dr. Reddy, his team, and we would like to find out many more outlets, how we can get the word out and how can we blend this science and present it to Ayurvedic doctors, <clears throat> students, and anybody who needs it. And I think uh, Dr. Katia is absolutely right because the proof is in the pudding. If at all we know it works in the lab, it works in the clinical trials, then the next step is to get the word out and try it with people, uh, like with who are developing initial symptoms, who are actually having a active symptoms with positive mm -hmm. tests. I think that would be the real proof where how quickly those symptoms can be reversed. So we would seek your help. Thank you again for your time. Good night, good evening. Yeah. Thank, good you thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Suhas. Thank you. Thank, thank you all, thank you all. Thank you, Namaskar. Namaskar.